Hi, my name is Shanda Blackman, and I'm a thoracic surgeon at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, we're here at SCTS at the meeting for CTSNet, and we'll be interviewing Dr. Renee Pedersen, Dr. Eric Lim, and Dr. Joel Dunning. And we'll be having a conversation about VATS lobectomy, what are the limits, what's the evidence today that it's of any benefit, and where are we headed? So I'll start the conversation by talking to Dr. Pedersen. What do you think is the evidence for VATS, and why is the adoption rate so low? Well, I think that we've been doing VATS in Copenhagen now for 17 years, and we've been training many surgeons over Europe. They've come to our institution to watch us do minimal invasive resections, and then we have also been supporting many units uh, across Europe. Uh, the adoption rate is increasing, but it is true that it is increasing very slow. Uh, uh, when you look at the figures from the UK, it's been a very slow adoption, uh, but until two or three years ago, but the, the, latest, the latest numbers from, from the UK is 30%, and it's come from, from almost zero to 30 in five years. So I think that the adoption rate is increasing. And what we really need is, um, is training, is to train people to get surgeons across the learning curve, because minimal invasive surgery should be standard of practice, as I see it. It's true that there are very few randomized trials. Um, uh, the Danish randomized trials uh, from Odense uh, is going to be published very soon. Uh, and so we will uh, await the results from this trial. And I'm sure that Eric will, will talk about the Violet trial uh, later. Um, and uh, the evidence so far um, comes from large cohort studies and retrospective databases. And they are, they are quite large and quite significant. And what we see is that there are benefits on the short term uh, in pain, length of stay, uh, muscle function, shoulder strengths, um, and what is most important, I think, is that we've seen a reduction in complications uh, when moving uh, to a bad space uh, approach. Uh, we did a study we published last year uh, where we compared uh, historical uh, uh, the VAT lobectomies from the previous years to to uh, open thoracotomies, and, and there was a significant reduction in the complication rate. Um, when it comes to survival, uh, we really don't know. Some studies indicate that there might be a slight survival benefit for VATS, um, uh, but that has to be proved in, in larger randomized trials, I think. So let's talk to the expert on the randomized trial. <laughs> Tell us why you think we need a randomized trial. Well, I think, uh, Shanda, going from zero to 30 in five years is very slow for most car manufacturers. Ferrari or Porsche won't quite be impressed with that kind of speed or rate of uptake. And so why would, what I would say is that why bother with fat slow back to me? We don't have any evidence of pe why people need to change. In my own personal experience as a trainer, I see there are two types of trainees, one who have played video games and one who do not have played video games. The ones who have played video games can do the procedures. The ones who don't play video games struggle a lot with it. And the real question is, for people who are struggling, what's the incentive to do vasculobectomy? That's, that's the crunch of the question. In the absence of randomized evidence, there is no real incentive to move us towards changing a practice of care, doing something with surgeons are not comfortable with. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, a procedure done safely with good oncologic clearance and low uh, morbidity and mortality is the primary outcome for all thoracic surgeons. Now the question is, should we do it through keyhole or open? And in the absence of randomized trials, I don't think that you know, there's any incentive for people to move towards VATS lobectomy. So you think we absolutely have to have a randomized trial? I think there's sufficient equipoise uh, in Europe to have a randomized trial. This question was posed a few years ago in Edinburgh at a world experts meeting in VATS lobectomy, and the United States contingent at that time said that there was no uh, equipoise in the United States to conduct such a, such a study. And if you look at clinicaltrials.gov to date, the only um, three countries which are conducting randomized trial is 
Denmark, the United Kingdom, and China. And I think there's one possibly starting in the Netherlands. So unfortunately, it, it's going to be Europe and the rest of the world that's going to be informing on bacillobectomy for the future. Right. Well, I recently uh, read something that Dr. D'Amico had written talking about our large databases and that we don't need to do randomized trials so much anymore now that we have these large databases and we can propensity match patients. One of the concerns that you have when you looked at some of these matched studies is the lower rate of lymph node yield when you compare VATS patients to open patients. So Joel, what do you think about that? Is that concerning or do you think that maybe the surgeons that are doing the VATS are a little different than the surgeons that are doing the open, maybe not taking as many nodes? Yeah, I think as a community, we are guilty as vatslobectomists of not listening to our open colleagues. I think uh, we don't give them a forum for, for voicing this. And even at this meeting a little bit, we've heard those very legitimate concerns that lymphadenectomy is absolutely vital. As Eric says, the patients want their lung cancer cured. Uh, there is out there a Japanese anomaly where Japan has some phenomenally high resection rates. They have 90% survival in stage one. What are they doing different? The one thing I think they're doing different is phenomenal lymphadenectomy. So we as a community, I think, really got to listen and, and listen to the concerns of people that also do thoracotomy. There's a huge number of people out there still doing thoracotomy. And what are their concerns? Exactly as you say, their concern is, can I do a fantastic job about the lymph node harvest? And uh, and I think Eric has set up a fantastic study that's going to look at that. But we also, as a community, have to really listen to our thoracotomy colleagues and see what they're saying. So can I, I just add to that to say that the argument about lymph, lymph node dissection and clearance is a good one. But the Akazog Z30 showed there's no difference if we actually perform the systematic node dissection or lymph node sampling, suggesting that both uh, patients in both arms will do equally well in terms of overall survival. But there were weaknesses to that study. The, the differences between the uh, sampling and full lymphadenectomy groups were not as far apart as perhaps current practice, would you not say? Yes, I would agree. So therefore, in a randomized trial design setting, it's really difficult to compare the quality of lymph node dissection for two procedures. And so within Violet, what we've decided was to have each surgeon has his own internal control. And the only way to judge whether or not two access leads to different lymph node dissection is not how many lymph nodes come out, but rather how much upstaging happens between clinical N0, N1 to pathologic N2. And if the two accesses have an equal um, clearance with respect to the surgeon doing the procedure, then we expect the upstaging to be approximately similar. And clearly these people who are saying that you can't do a good lymphadenectomy in a VATS have not seen Dr. Pedersen do a lymphadenectomy. <laughs> On your video that you showed at the meeting, it was the most thorough lymphadenectomy I've ever seen. It was very impressive. There's nothing left but the airway. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, I think it's, it's a matter of the surgeon's attitude towards lymph nodes, I think. And, and, uh, and some surgeons do not find the evidence for a, a, a thorough lymph node dissection. Um, We've, we've been doing this from the very beginning because this was in the very beginning of the VATS era was one of, uh, one of the arguments for not doing VATS. So we, we've been very eager to show that you can do a very thorough lymph node dissection. Uh, and I think you can do it safely by VATS. You have the magnification. So the field is three times magnified. You have the angulation of the camera. So you can see very clear all the minor lymph nodes and you can uh, you can address the, the vessels, lymph lymphatic vessels and, and the other vessels so that you can uh, uh, operate in a very dry field which, which uh, increases the overview when you do the lymph node dissection. So if you look around the world in your area, the rate of adoption is extremely high. Thoracic practice is limited in your area, correct? So only thoracic surgeons are taking out lobes of the lung, is that correct? Yes. So you do not have general surgeons like we do in the United States who might be doing a lobectomy. So I think that might be one of the reasons why we see a low rate of adoption. Some people don't have access to the equipment. Others don't have training. They don't have specific thoracic focus training. Or they may have trained in an area where they did not get VATS training. So to overcome those obstacles, I think most of us might want to focus on trying to raise the level that someone's trained before they're allowed to do thoracic surgery. I think limiting and focusing the surgeon is very important. There are a lot of places around the United States 
where you have surgeons who do some cardiac, some thoracic. In most high-end academic places, there is a specific focus on one area. There are very few people in academic practices that will do both thoracic and cardiac. Do you think that has an effect on the VATS adoption? Definitely. When you, when you look across Europe, US, and China, the, the setup for, for thoracic surgery is, is very diverse. So you have surgeons coming from a cardiac background, you have surgeons coming from a general surgical background, and uh, in, in many, and you have many small centers, especially in Central Europe, you have many small centers where the surgeons are doing a bit of everything. And, and I think part of the success we've had in Denmark with an, an uh, VATS rate of now 60%, uh, the latest uh, 2015 um, uh, figures from the Danish Lung Cancer Registry, um, is because uh, we've been uh, very lucky with our uh, um, centralization. I'm going to address this in my, in my talk this afternoon, but we, we've, uh, we've split uh, cardiac and thoracic at a consultant level uh, almost 10 years ago. So we have only, only thoracic surgeons doing uh, lung resections. And we've even subspecialized further. So in, in our institution, we have several teams. So we have a VATS team, we have a esophageal team, and we have a classic open team. But open surgery has also changed over the last 10, 15 years, moving to more and more uh, extended resections. We resect patients that we didn't resect 10 years ago. So pancose tumors, uh, um, advanced uh, cases involving the spine, um, so T4 uh, cancers, are, are, we're really trying to push that. And to do that, we need a dedicated team of subspecialists. And, uh, and I think we've been very successful with that. And I, I think that's what's going to drive uh, the thoracic community in the future. That is a specialization and subspecialization. And I think you will see this in, in any, any field of medicine. Yeah. So so can I come on to that, uh, Rene? Sure. The, your subspecialization in Denmark is such as the big operations are done by the open thoracic surgeons and the early stage cancers done by the bats lobectomy surgeons. Uh, in our practice, I find that the best use of VATS lobectomy is in the major operations. Because when we do our pancose tumors, what we do is a single port upper lobectomy first. And then we can do a very limited posterior incision or anthrocervical to actually access the tumor. So for moving towards a whole anthrocervical approach or a complete Paulson approach, which are the two biggest incisions in thoracic surgery, the real benefit or magnitude effect, in my opinion, for the VATS lobectomy is in these such operations. Because often, for the early stage, we're arguing thoracotomy, open, whereas in the huge operations, we're now we're talking about an incision this big, followed by a limited chest wall resection. Yeah, you can do that in minor tumors, but sometimes the tumors are very big. Uh, I, my point is that, you know, you, you cannot be a specialist in every field, so you need to focus. Um, and so if, if you want to do a hybrid procedure, as you propose for, for pancose tumors, you should bring the two teams together. So the open team should do the, the, the cervical uh, incision that they are, they are used to this approach, and the VATS team can do the VATS lobectomy that they are used to. I think that's the way to bring this to a higher level. Um, so I think we have to move away from one or two surgeons who can master everything, and the rest uh, are, are trying to follow. We, we need to realize that you cannot be a master in every field. You need to focus on a minor field. And when you look at, at data or evidence for VATS, so 10, 15 years ago, there were one or two VATS papers a month. And now there's a lot. Every day you open uh, uh, the PubMed, there are, there are new VATS papers. And, and so, so the, the number of, of papers on VATS is increasing dramatically. And I think if you want to stay focused, you, you, need, you need to subspecialize and concentrate on one, on one area to become a um, qualified specialist in that area. I think you might be right. So when you look at the people that are going to be randomizing for the violet trial, you'll have the same surgeon doing the open and the VATS. Are you worried at all that some of these surgeons might not be very good VAT surgeons and contra contrary, other surgeons might not be very good open surgeons? Um, <clears throat> exactly, that's a very good point. So in the clinical trials literature, there are two types of randomized trial. One is what we call expertise-based design where the patients are randomized to the two procedures. And just as Renee said, in, the, in that case, you'd be randomized to a thoracic open team or a thoracic VATS team. Whereas in England or 
they, they are, we are more in tune with the randomization unit to be the surgeon himself. Okay. So if the surgeon is very, very good as a bad surgeon, we assume he's also very good as an open surgeon, but also vice versa. Mm -hmm. And also, the outcomes are related to surgeon management. So in general, we find that the VATS lobectomy surgeons tend to be more proactive in pain management, quicker on removing the drains, quicker on you know, mobilizing the patients. And we don't want the bias in post-operative management to affect the outcomes of a VATS lobectomy trial. And so the randomization unit is a surgeon based on preoperative, operative, and post-operative management. Can, can I maybe ask you, Eric, um, I'm part of your study, which I fully support, and uh, we're all obsessed by making it the 2016 best fat slobectomy <laughs> can, we can do. Are we slightly guilty of not trying to do the 2016 best thoracotomy we can do? When I go around and I talk to thoracotomy surgeons, they say, I can't get my hand in, I do a whole stat size. Should we not be doing the 2016 best thoracotomy we can do? I think it's uh, up to each uh, incumbent on all the participants for, uh, for Violet to do the best thoracotomy that they themselves can do. But even for the best thoracotomy, there's still a lot of uh, equipoise. People are not certain if it's the size of the incision or the amount of rib spreading, or if you take the section of rib out. Some surgeons say that actually, if you do a small incision, you have a worse pain because you have to spread the incision more. Other surgeons say if you have a large thoracotomy, you're able to you know, um, use less force on spreading the ribs. Suffice to say that in Violet, we don't restrict surgeons to which, however you want to do a thoracotomy. We're monitoring if you're using an anterolateral approach, a posterior approach, uh, and pretty much if you've used rib spreading or not as the three main outcomes on the thoracotomy uh, case report form. And then we can actually, once we have the data, have a you know, preliminary analysis to see whether or not any of this actually makes any difference to the outcome. So if there's equipoise in Europe, what about the patients? Do the patients have equipoise? Will they allow themselves to be randomized? It seems to me that most of the time when my patients show up, they know exactly what they want. They've already been throughout the internet. They've sometimes even gone on to PubMed, and they come in the room with the research and say, this is what I want. So, it's, do, yeah, so do you think they'll allow themselves to be randomized? So that's a, another very good point, Shanda. So, it's difficult to recruit to all surgical trials in principle. Mm -hmm. That's just how it is. And so we in the United Kingdom, before we even started the trial, started training our surgeons on how to speak to patients. So all the Violet Principal investigators went to Bristol Trials Unit, and the Bristol Trials Unit have a very famous qualitative research intervention team, where they were asked to uh, rescue a fledgling trial called PROTECT, which is a prostate cancer trial, comparing active treatment versus robotic surgery versus medical treatment. And that trial couldn't recruit because patients didn't have equipoise and participants didn't have equipoise. But with the correct use of the language and the correct training, surgeons are able to convey equipoise and allow patients to understand that genuinely experts are not sure. And with that, we then get a good uh, recruitment rate. Recruitment rate is monitored in each of the five centers religiously. All the audio, all the um, conversations our patients are audio recorded. And then the audio recording is sent back to Bristol. How you speak to patients, what they say, and how you reply is documented, analyzed, and then a summary uh, will be sent back to you for continuous feedback throughout the trial. So we're very lucky to have that system in place. And also very fortunate to report that we are recruiting ahead of target with the uh, average uh, participation rate of more than 50%, which is exactly what we've kind of predicted. Well, I think the three of you represent what's best in the field of vatslobectomy. Dr. Pedersen, pushing the envelope, training your center, training other people, allowing people to come and see how you do it, doing a thorough lymphadenectomy, trying to give your patient the best minimally invasive surgery they can get, designing a trial that certainly sounds like you've gone to tremendous effort to make sure that it's as perfect as it can be. We'll all be on the edge of our seat waiting to see what happens. And Joel, with your microlobectomy, I think you're definitely pushing the envelope, trying to spare the patient some pain. And I've appreciated learning from you as well. So all three of you, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a really interesting discussion, and I can't wait to see what the future of thoracic surgery, that surgery, holds for us. Mm -hmm.